Braindonk is a little city uh, close to Antwerp in which there was a concentration camp where they would separate women and men and, and, and strong people and weaker people and send them to different parts in, in Germany and, and Poland and Belgium. This poem is called The Feather at Braindonk. I'm praying again, God, pale God, here between white sky and snow by the larch I planted last spring with one branch broken at the elbow. I pick it up, I wave winter away, I do things like that, call the bluebirds back, throwing yarn and straw in the meadow, and they do come so terribly blue, they're strangled, tiu, tiu, echoing my prayer, Dieu, Dieu, the same Dieu who stained the feather I found in the barbed fields of the Brendon concentration camp near Antwerp in 1952. My father tried to slap it out of my hand. It's filthy. But I held on to it. I knew it was an angel's. They only killed a few Jews here, he said, seven, eight hundred maybe. So I wave their angels away with my feather, away from my father, away from the terribly blue skies over the Braindonk Canal, where barges loaded bricks for Antwerp, where my father loaded ships for Rotterdam, Bremerhaven, Hamburg, and Antwerp grew, and the port expanded, and his business flourished, and all the while, he kept repeating, that's all we needed, a good war. Some of you know who Dr. Mengele was. Do you all know? I don't have to explain. He was a, a doctor who uh, experimented on Jewish children in the camp. And this is a story about a little boy that I met that had come back from those camps when I was four or five or six, um, and he was the same age. Leak Street. Leak Street in Bruges was a cul-de-sac so narrow, cars never scarred its mossy cobblestones. Every house had a niche above the door, framed by high brick walls. Carved in the back rampart, an iron gate opened on the wool canal. Now and then, a muskrat's head purled out of that green velvet and then slipped back into the water. The belfry rang a bronze quiver through the drizzle every quarter. Jochemke lived at number eight in the only house with open curtains and no saint in the niche. He was nine. He had a large hole in his tongue and six numbers tattooed on his arm. They did this when he was a baby, he said. He couldn't remember if it hurt. I loved him so much that I repeated the number inside his arm every night until I fell asleep. Jochemke, 743-236. It rained the day he said I could put my finger through his tongue. He shut his pale eyes, I shut mine, and he slowly closed his lips around my finger. Something guilty and deep made me want to cry. We were setting muskrat traps by the canal the first time he said he loved me. I wanted to play the piano and, and be beautiful and have curly hair. I was so happy. The muskrats were for his father who made collars and muffs out of them to sell at the fish market. He always came back with something for Jochemke. Once it was a marble with a heart of green, blue, and gold. When Jochemke gave it to me, we were sitting by the canal, stirring the algae with willow sticks. His father had told him that the heart of the marble was what the world looked like before the Germans. That night, we climbed the belfry tower to make the bronze bell ring with the marble. Up there, looking down at the brown roofs and fields of the world, we wanted to change it back to how it was and make it look like the marble again. We would set trap for the Germans, 
poke holes in their tongues, hurl their bodies in the canal, and all the muskrats of Bruges would feed on them, and then they'd fatten, and then we'd trap them, and then, I'll buy you a piano, said Jochemke. We'll be the richest muff makers in Belgium. Then, with our marble, we tapped the bell as hard as we could and listened to its small sound float out over the canals. This is a poem about the imagination, the things that you know, that you hear, that you are aware of vaguely, and that take a different life in your head. Um, one thing I want to tell you, polders are lands that are taken back from the sea in Belgium, and there are uh, potato and leek fields in the polders there. And also, do you know what a capo is? A capo, it was a, a horrible thing that happened uh, to certain Jewish people in the camps, where a capo was a, a Jewish man who was ordered to tell on and and survey and, um, uh, I don't know, report on anything that was going wrong in the camps. And if he didn't do it, he'd be killed and somebody else would replace him. So it was a terrible place to be in because they had to report on their own or they would die. The cellar. I want my father to stop sending me down there to fetch his daily gin and the potatoes for supper. But there's no saying no to him and no more places to hide. He's found them all. Outside, the cellar's rusted door stains my hands as I yank it open, scraping a branch that whips back and grabs me like he does. Six stairs stop by a second door with a hasp and a slit between two thick planks. I press my face to it, whisper to the bottles and the potatoes, go away, go away, I'm coming. But how can they? We're all damned in this big brick house in Antwerp and I'm the capo, I have no choice. It's them or me. I kneel in the cellar and pray, don't let me separate families. Don't let me kill a child. Then inch toward the shelves and reach. Sometimes I think I hear a moan, a sob. Sometimes it's a child's wail, so exactly like mine. I think it comes out of me. So I quickly put the thing back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The worst are the potatoes. I know exactly how they lived before, rooted deep in the wild, salted polders where lapwings titter between cattails and winds and rows of loam run past the horizon. And here they are now, uprooted and cluttered in crates, limbs groping for a wedge of life and light in a cellar door. But then, from up there comes father's call, weary, irked, with that pitch and threat in the last vowel of my name. So I grab the gin, the potatoes, hold them as far as I can from my body, run up, throw them on the table, and escape to my room where I sit, pounding my ears with my fists so as not to hear yet another cry for mercy. We've heard a lot in the United States and in Ireland and in Belgium. We, we all know what happened to so many boys who were raised in boys' schools and boys' boarding schools and how they were um, mishandled, shall we say, uh, by priests. What is lesser known is that the same thing went on um, in nunneries and in convents and that many, many girls um, and um, were as terribly um, mistreated as the boys. And this is a poem about that. I need you to know that um, many Jewish children uh, that um, came out of the camps were placed by the Red Cross in Catholic nunneries and schools by the Red Cross so that the next of kid could come and find them. And sometimes it took a year, sometimes two years to find a, a, a far away cousin of a cousin of a brother of a cousin who finally would find, because all the rest of the families were dead, where had been gassed and killed. This is a story about that, and a poem about that. The Pallor of Survival. 
I'm lucky. Autumn is flawless today. Sidewalks freckled rust and red, and the sun is gentle. I'll take the back streets to the bookstore. It's a longer ride, but I avoid that street where St. John the Evangelist faces that seedy building with a sign that flashes Jews for Jesus. The last time I pedaled between them, I felt a draft there, something so chilling I gasped. I don't know what happened to Judith Aaron, placed in 1945 at the Mater Immaculata convent in, Con in Brussels after she was repatriated from Bergen-Belsen. Judith, who waited 11 years for some, any next of kin to claim her. No one ever came to the black in brass door. And we never saw her again after she turned 18 and left that very morning still wearing the convent uniform but the blouse open three buttons down <laughs> and the socks low on her white ankles. She left on a sleety day in October, years after from under a bed in the infirmary, I had seen what the nuns did to her when she confessed she had masturbated. Bending her over, pulling down her panties to ram the longest part of a, un of a ivory crucifix into her, hissing, he is the only one who can come inside you. No one else, you hear? She did not let out a sound. She did not let out a sigh the pallor of survival carved into her face when she pulled her panties up again. I think she made it. She was of the stone statues are made of. And yet, I still search. Judith, I cannot stop searching for signs that we made it. You, me, and the others. Signs that I find in the smallest things, a flawless sky, a leaf, autumn turns or an open gate. This poem was about starting to realize that I had to witness, that I, that I had, that I was part of something that needed to be told. It's called Seven Fragments on Hearing a Hammer Pounding. January 1st, 2000. I sit by a large by the way, this was written in Colorado. I sit by a large pen and journal in my lap. Two suns in my tea, the lemon slice the brightest. Tannin clouds the mug's sky, and today's fate still steeps in its leafy depths. I count each blow of a hammer somewhere up the street and want it to stop at 7 or 17 or 21 or anything with a 7, but it never does even when I give it seven last chances. I need an augury, I need a sign to help me believe that the pounding means something good. Antwerp, 1947. My parents hoarding profits from what they call the good war, are happy. A million hammers, 10 million nails are needed to rebuild Europe, and my father sells iron and steel. One's misery is the other's happiness, he says, as we drive through Pelican Street and what had been the Jewish quarter. I'm five. 65 years later, I still remember. Winds blew dust and ashes through the empty bellies of bombed houses. Some walls still stood for no one. Gutted doors and windows looked like screaming mouths caught in brick. Blocks of them and blocks and blocks and blocks of them. Father spits out his cigarette. Nothing's changed here. Only pigeons instead of Jews. He says Jews in Flemish, Joden. He says Joden. I don't know that word, Joden. So I ask, what kind of animals are Joden? My parents laugh and laugh. 
to think that I spoke their tongue before finding mine. O oh, gods of grief, grant me this. Some tongues will die, some tongues must. 1961, Oscar Vladislas Miloš teaches writing workshops in Brussels. I brandish my notebooks filled with Baudelaire and Aragon and Jean-Paul Sartre. I'm 18. Everything's been said, Monsieur Miloš, I said. What is left to write about? Write about your time, he says. Nothing's been said about your time. Then on the blackboard, he says, Le présent, lieu seul d'où j'écris, soleil de la mémoire. The present, single place from where I write, memory's sun. Two suns in my tea, the lemon slice the brightest, today's writing still brews in my mug's leafy depths. From which memory will I, must I speak? Which present do I, must I call mine? Thief, 1950. Ox blood drapes frame father's office windows. 10 million hammers pound nails in Belgium, France, Holland, Italy, England, Russia, Poland, and Germany. Germany, too. Building roofs, barns, houses, churches, schools, railroads, and bridges after the war. Father loads iron and steel onto Antwerp shifts, and he's a rich man now. I wait for him to return from meetings, and I'm seven. A dusk sun strokes the drapes. His mahogany desk gleams blood red. I open a drawer and see father's pen. I hear ships from the harbor urge me, do it, do it. So I reach for it, gold and heavy, and I take it and I uncap it and I draw a line in my palm and the ink is black, a strong, hard black. The door opens, father grabs his pen, slaps my face, knees my chest, but listen. My need to write started then, a hunger to write, to own a pen, but not, but never, prayer. Dusk, on a chair by the larch, my journal and pen. Oh, small gods of grief, grant me to write from seven memories deep, but not in my father's tongue, but not with his pen. My grandfather was a fabulous man, not my father, but my grandfather, my mother's father. Um, he didn't like my father very much, nor did I. This poem is called, oh, what you need to know, um, miserere is a Latin term that says have pity or have pity on us. Um, it's a um, term used during the, the Catholic mass. And that's all you need to know. Thank you for coming. Inventory. Thanksgiving today, soaked with sleet. No sun for six days. Six is the devil's number. I have looked through this window at these American skies for two times six years. My wall is covered with photographs, but of distant friends. This is my third garden. The first two blossomed in Belgium, where there is no Thanksgiving, where my father is buried, where I was raised and raped and worked, where I had five lovers but loved only one, where I gave birth to three children, a blonde son, a dead daughter, and a blonde daughter. Shadows grew in my first garden, two larches, in my second, and because of North Sea winds and how they stood, they fused into one trunk. It wounded them at first, that rubbing together, the frailest larch losing sap for months, a lucid sap that glued them together at last. And I saw that as an omen for my life. I give thanks for the lowlands in Belgium, for Flanders, her canals and taciturn skies, for the tall ships on the river Scheldt, for cold pyramids in Wallonia, for the colors of hop 
in the hop picker's songs, for Antwerp's whores who woo sailors in six different tongues. Six is the devil's number. My grandfather and a farmer killed six German soldiers and threw them in a Flemish moor, and I can no longer give thanks for that. I ask mercy. Before I die, I'll plant a larch by that moor, miserere. The soldiers' mothers will never know it was done. I prayed six times for the death of my Jew-hating father. I asked mercy for that also. It's Thanksgiving today. I give thanks for my son. I give thanks for my daughter, for the man I love, who taught me a new language, for this garden's life and sleet. Before I left for this vast continent, I stole sand from the river shelled, an inch of barbed wire from a concentration camp near Antwerp, a leaf from the chestnut tree behind Apollinaire's grave, but no weed, not a seed of it, growing from my father's ashes. In Belgium, the day is almost over. This new century is already making history. Misere. Four larches grow in my garden, one for my son, one for my daughter, and far from a moor in Flanders, the other two fuse here, in America, in America. Thank you. Thank you.